Greetings everyone and welcome to a little video where I'm going to try to show you some examples of how to calculate how many G's you're pulling. Now this is a new term that we haven't really used this year but what this really refers to is something which is called the number of G's or perhaps G-force um, and it's an object's apparent weight and by apparent weight I don't mean this is the force of gravity acting on it but rather how you feel about that force of gravity. Do you feel normal? Do you feel heavier? Do you feel lighter? And this can all be related to what's called a number of G's. You might have heard about this with like a fighter pilot or riding a ride at Cedar Point. Now another way of looking at the number of G's is that it's the number of times lighter or heavier an object feels. And you calculate it by taking the ratio of the normal force and the force of gravity. And remember, force of gravity is also known as weight. So here's our formula to calculate the number of g's that you are pulling. Um, remember that you don't actually feel the force of gravity. You feel your interaction with the surroundings through that normal force. For example, let's say that you are in free fall. In free fall, by definition, the only force acting on you is the force of gravity. And therefore, your normal force is zero. Plugging that into the equation, you can see that you would be pulling zero g's. And so because you're pulling zero g's, it doesn't mean that you're weightless. There's still a force of gravity acting on you, but you feel weightless because the floor is not supporting you at all. And so it feels just like somebody flipped a switch and you turned off gravity. Now right now, you are probably sitting in a non-accelerating chair where you have a force of gravity acting on you, but you also have a support force from your chair, which would be upward and would be the normal force. Since you are not accelerating at this moment, those forces have to balance. And so if we plug that into our number of g's, if the normal force is equal to the force of gravity, when you put them in a ratio and divide, you get 1. So 1 g is what you feel normally when you're not accelerating. And this is the normal situation when you step on a bathroom scale. You're usually not in an accelerating frame of reference. And so the bathroom scale measures the force it has to use to support you, which is just equal to the force of gravity. But again, that's only if you're not accelerating. So let's now take a quick look at a couple of situations that will be helpful on your Cedar Point packet and look at the number of Gs in those situations. First of all, let's look at a cart, which is going to accelerate down a frictionless incline. Hopefully that's not what happens to you when you ride a ride at Cedar Point. First of all, remember that we must rotate our axes so that our x-axis is in the direction of motion. And we always do that to make the acceleration one-dimensional. The force of gravity acts straight down. Since it is not along an axis, we need to break it up into the perpendicular component, f of gy, and the parallel component, f of gx. Notice where the right angle is between the perpendicular components. And of course, the angle at the top here is the angle of inclination. There is also a support force from the track. This support force will act perpendicular to the track, because after all, that's what normal means. And so it acts right along the y-axis. And that normal force will be exactly equal to f of gy because it's not accelerating along the perpendicular axis, which we're calling y. That's why we rotate the axes, so that the, all of the acceleration is along the x-axis and not along the y. Now, if it's frictionless, these are the only forces acting on the cart. And therefore, f of gx is in balanced and so f of gx causes it to accelerate down the incline. Now in this case, I'm not worried about the acceleration, which is normally what we've calculated here. We need to find the normal force in order to find the number of g's. So as we just said, the normal force is balanced by f of gy. And if we do a little right triangle trig here, f of gy is the adjacent side to the angle. So we can use the cosine function cosine of theta is adjacent side over hypotenuse, f of gy over f of g. The horizontal line means divide, so we move f of g to the other side by multiplying. 
So f of gy is f of g cosine theta, and we can plug that in right there. So f of n is f of g cosine theta. And as we've done many times this year, as long as we are near the surface of the Earth, we know that the force of gravity acting on any object is its mass times its gravitational field strength. So the number of g's in this case is the normal force you're feeling divided by your force of gravity. The normal force you're feeling is mg cosine theta. The force of gravity, or your weight, is mg. They cancel. And so your number of g's is simply the cosine of theta. All it depends on is the angle of the track. And notice, the bigger the angle gets, the smaller the cosine gets, if you're going from 0 to 90 here, right? assuming that at most it's 90. Although there is a ride at Cedar Point, the Maverick, where you go down a hill that actually goes into the hill, and it's a bigger than a 90 degree angle. But in this case, we're going from 0 to 90. And so the cosine gets smaller the steeper it gets. And that means you feel lighter and lighter. So you feel lighter since the normal force is always less than your weight at any non-zero angle. This force is slightly smaller than this one. One more situation. Let's say that you are going through a circular valley at constant speed, just to make the calculations easier. So we're going to draw a force diagram. So there's our valley. And we're going to look right at the bottom. So at the bottom, there would be, of course, a force of gravity acting downward on you. And since you're at the bottom of the, uh, of the circular valley, the normal force would act upward on you. Now, how big does that normal force have to be? Well, if you're moving in a circle, the net force and therefore the acceleration must act inward. And inward, in this case, is upward. And the only way your net force and acceleration can be upward is if the normal force is bigger than the force of gravity. So right now, before we even calculate anything, we should expect that our number of g's is bigger than 1. You are pulling more than 1 g right now, and you will feel heavier through the valley. If we had done this going over a hill, then the normal force would be smaller than the force of gravity, and you would get less than 1 g. But I'm only going to do one example here. So Newton's second law says that the net vertical force has to equal the mass times the acceleration. Well, the net vertical force is f of n minus f of g, since they're pointing in opposite directions. f of n is up, positive. f of g is down, negative. Since we're moving in a circle here at constant speed with an inward directed net force and acceleration, this isn't just any random acceleration. This is the centripetal acceleration. And since it's upward, inward, it's positive. So we get f of n minus f of g is the net force, and that has to equal a positive mac. Couple of substitutions. We know, of course, that the force of gravity can be written as mass times gravitational field strength near the surface of the Earth. And we know that the centripetal acceleration is the speed squared divided by the radius. And that can go right there. So plugging those in, we get normal force minus mg equals mv squared over r. Now notice here, the m's don't cancel because there isn't an m in this term. Right? To cancel something out, it has to be in all the terms. Remember, don't be sloppy with your algebra. So solving for the normal force, it is simply the force of gravity plus the net force, mg plus mv squared over r. Hopefully, after doing all those MOPs, you see why this is. Right? Because you have to have your normal force has to be bigger than gravity, and it's bigger by the net force, which is mv squared over r. Plugging that into our numbers, number of g's equation and putting in that f of g again is mg, we get this. Notice here, there are m's in each one of these. So the interesting thing here is that it doesn't matter how big you are, how massive you are. It doesn't matter on a roller coaster, say, whether the cart is full or the cart is empty. Uh, it's all pulling the same Gs. That's because more mass means more gravity, but more mass also means more inertia. And those things cancel out. Now, if we divide through by G, it cancels on this term, but not on this one. And so we're left with 1 plus V squared over RG. If you were going over a, uh, v uh, sorry, over a circular hill, the only difference would be that your acceleration would have been negative because it would be down, which would be inward. So there'd be a minus sign here, here, and here. 
So notice whatever this is, you're going to end up adding these and getting a number of G's bigger than one, and so you'll feel heavier. Going over the top of a hill, it would be one minus this, so you would end up with a number of G's less than one between zero and one, and so you would feel lighter. The faster you go, the more G's you pull. And so this is the kind of calculation they have to do for a fighter pilot, say, or an astronaut, so that they can, if they're going too fast uh, through a circle like this, they can end up actually uh, blacking out, and that's not good if you're the pilot. But at Cedar Point, the most you can do, I believe, is, is on uh, one of the roller coasters, you sometimes pull as many as three to four Gs, which means you feel as you go through the valley as if you are three to four times heavier than you actually are, which can be quite painful on the legs, depending on how you set things up. So hopefully this has helped you understand how to calculate the number of Gs on your Cedar Point packet. Get that thing finished, get it turned in, and if you're a senior, finish physics.